So much of what I've pledged to do as U.S. president is, to say the least, amongst people who have actually worked in the federal government, quite controversial. On one hand, I've actually bucked the trend of the U.S. national defense establishment by saying that we should actually use the U.S. military to protect our own border and to potentially go the further step of using it to even annihilate the Mexican drug cartels and thereby solve a fentanyl crisis that's responsible for 100,000 deaths of Americans here on American soil. Now, to most Americans across the country, including in places where I've traveled, Iowa, New Hampshire, my home state in Ohio and elsewhere, this is an intuitive idea. The idea that you would use the U.S. military to protect Americans on American soil, even from a foreign threat, even to a neighbor, or especially to a neighbor with whom we share a border. But it turns out that in the national security establishment, that is actually the very reason why it is unthinkable to use the U.S. military in that context. Another pledge I've made is that the way to reform the national security establishment and the police state at home starts with, for example, shutting down an institution like the FBI, just closing the keys, saying that that agency ceases to exist, but to create a new one to take its place. Obviously, we do need a federal law enforcement function. But when the police arm of that function becomes so rotten, so politicized, so corrupt as it has not only in recent years, but actually for this institution in a way that dates back decades, the right way to solve that problem isn't through incremental reform, but through a quantum leap of reform, which means shutting down the agency itself. Again, as you might imagine, this is a controversial idea, not just within the national security establishment, but in the minds of anyone who works in the federal government. And the things I'll hear is that you legally can't take these steps, that you're constitutionally or statutorily prohibited from shutting down the FBI because of, you know, let's go down the list, civil service protections, impoundment prevention, boring stuff, but real stuff that relates to statutory provisions that Congress has passed, despite the fact the Constitution says, Article 2 says that the U.S. president runs the executive branch of the government. On the military side, they'll say, that no, 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 the protecting the borders is a a law enforcement function, not a military function. Solving the drug crisis is a law enforcement function, not a military function. Well, here's the, re here's the real deal. Most Americans across the country understand, I believe, these constitutional principles more deeply than even the people who are hired to safeguard them. And the reason I'm having the guest I have on the podcast today is he's somebody who understands both sides here because he has worked in the U.S. federal government under multiple Republican administrations in senior roles, somebody who understands the relationship between the Constitution, the statutes that govern how Congress does or doesn't limit executive authority. And we're going to roll up our sleeves and get into the meat of that today because I think it's a pretty special opportunity that I've been looking forward to to sit down with somebody who I've spoken to many times over Zoom and on the phone over the last year, uh, but somebody who I'm sitting down with for the first time in person I'm excited to do it. Welcome to the podcast, Bill. Thanks, Hall. Vivek. Yeah, I appreciate being here. It's good to be here. We we found each other through some, uh, you know, I would say we we found each other. I think was was how we got set up initially. <clears throat> you found me initially. I from yeah, the, I, I the ESG what, issue. I think. Yeah, I liked what you were saying on ESG, and I mentioned it to a mutual friend we have, and yep, he put us in touch with each other. That was the first time we connected, and then even if we hadn't connected through that, I know you found me. I, I would have found you after having read that. Wall Street Journal op-ed that you more recently published on using the U.S. military to solve the Mexican drug cartel problem, which stood out to me. But before we get into the specifics and the meat of those issues, <clears throat> maybe we could start with the Mexican drug cartel issue as an example. Who makes the call on whether or not it is a legally permissible use of, say, the U.S. military? to actually solve a problem that the U.S. military previously hasn't solved, like protecting the border, like actually going in and solving the cartels. We'll get to the merits of that in a second. But the thing I'm interested in is, look, I'm looking to occupy the White House as the U.S. president in January 2025. Let's say that's a mandate I set into motion. This is something we need to do. <clears throat> Someone from the Joint Chiefs or from the military, you know, more broadly says, no, 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 Mr. President, that's not something that we can do. We don't have that authority. What happens from there? That's what I'm interested in. It's the president's call as to what national, what tools to use in, in dealing with an external threat. 
a lot of the confusion today, and it's a confusion that exists in Western cult countries and unfortunately in the United States, is the confusion between l law enforcement and national security. Law enforcement, uh, the, the Constitution essentially gives two powers to the federal government. One is to deal with internal errant members of society who flout the rules and have to be punished, violating the rules of the body politic right. here. And they are, th the power is law enforcement and it's hedged in with all kinds of safeguards so the government doesn't oppress the people, meaning mm -hmm. the American people. So- For it, good reason. Yeah, for good reason. And so, you know, there's due process, you elevate the rights of the individual. So they're really on the same plane as the government. And the other power deals with people who are not members of our body politic. They are external foes, external enemies that- threaten uh, the United States. And there, the Constitution gives the national security power, essentially, to the president. And it's at its maximum. The president has the ability to take steps to protect the country. Where people have got confused is in the terrorism area and the narcotics area. We've passed laws that also make it a crime to engage in activities overseas directing it against the United States. So a terrorist is violating US law. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it becomes only a law enforcement matter. Mm -hmm. we, we can pick the tools that we want to use. Sometimes it may be law enforcement, but other times it's national security. And people intuitively understand that. For example, you know, if it was law enforcement, we wouldn't be using drones to kill them. And people understand we do. And uh, that's because it's a, na you know, terrorism is a national security problem. And so is, are the foreign uh, narcotics operations, which are narco-terrorists. And, and so we can use national security power against them. Now, as you know, people have sort of attacked my article by saying, you know, invade Mexico and so forth. We have the ability- Say, Saying not- to the saying that you're claiming to invade yeah, Mexico. Yeah. Or, or just bomb them or something. Mm -hmm. No. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we have to intervene in Mexico eventually, hopefully with the Mexican support. But, uh, but, but we have the capacity through targeted and precision operations uh, to cripple the cartels. Um, I'm not saying we, it would be a carbon copy of what we did in Syria. But in Syria, with a few thousand special operators and the use of air power, we destroyed ISIS, tens of thousands of terrorists. And in Iraq, by the yeah, way, too. Right. Yeah. So we have, the, we, we have been increasing our capability to focus our military assets in a way that can cripple these kinds of organizations. And I think it's going to come to that. The, the, the fact that it's now of military proportions is illustrated by the Mexican government themselves. When they go in to arrest El Chapo's son, they sent 4,000 troops mm -hmm. to make an arrest. They didn't send in the local police department with handcuffs. <laughs> yeah. you know? the, they, I didn't know they said 4,000. I mean, I know it was yeah. a big, it was almost yeah. like a warlike struggle. Right, right. right. And, and they, they and then they him. left. Then and, they withdrew, and then, they got, and then because the actually they were overcome by the right. military like force of the right. Right. of the cartel. Yeah. So I think you know people know this, but you were most recently Attorney General under President Trump. Right. You've served under prior administrations as well. Which other administrations have you served under? I, I worked in the Reagan White House. Uh, I worked uh, under George H W. H W. Bush. Yeah. Got it, but not W. Not W. <clears throat> so here's one of the things that I've understood from national security establishment folks who I think helpfully, even if they disagree with me, have been helping me advance my plan to do this. I do intend to act on this. And you know, I think I think it's got to be a first six months kind of thing. What I've said is, we'll call whoever the president of Mexico is, let him know for a fraction of what we spent in Ukraine, here's the plan for how we can help you solve your Mexican drug cartel problem. It's, right now, they say silver or lead is the two choices for how the cartels deal with their own government. Well, we'll help you with silver and lead to overcome that. Yeah. Not because we love Mexico, but because we love America. 100,000 people dying from fentanyl crossing the southern border. We're going to so help you solve that problem. But if you don't do it, we're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. We're going to solve it one way or another. Now, what I hear tactically is that the NSA has was pivotal to the success in – Syria and Iraq of ridding ourselves of the ISIS problem there. 
that in principle, it could be much easier to gain the intelligence needed to do that in Mexico, but we just haven't done it. And that there's some basic time horizon it'll take for intelligence operations to make sure that those strikes are as targeted and as effective as they possibly can be while minimizing civilian casualty and actually getting to the heart of the problem. How familiar are you with this dynamic and and what do you think that time horizon looks like just from the standpoint of executing this? Right. Well, putting aside the issue of the extent to which the Mexicans will help us, probably about a year of of uh, complete analysis. Of Intelligence co- gathering yes. included. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And this wouldn't only require what they call kinetic strikes. This, this would involve things like sending in uh, special operators to dismantle the drug labs. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, you know, I don't think we should just be bombing drug, drug labs to minimize civilian casualties. We should be sending in groups to dismantle them so we have eyeballs on what we're doing. So it, it would be a host of, of actions uh, that could be taken, including cyber activity directed against the cartels. What would that look like? Well- Cyber activity. Well, getting into their financial uh, yeah. dealings and so forth. Yeah, I mean that that's we're taking some steps in that direction. I mean, that's what the designation if we did succeed in designating them right. as terrorist organizations that would Help ease, that, yes. ease the freezing of their financial assets. Right. Yeah. But back to the back to the original question of just the dynamic is interesting to me, right? I, I guess here's a question I ask is it's a little bit surprising to me that President Trump didn't already towards at least the latter half of his term take steps in this direction. He was focused on the fentanyl crisis. He was focused on the border. I assume, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I assume what the dynamic is, is that he would say from a policy perspective, this is something that he wanted to do. And then he would get resistance from the people who were in the Pentagon or elsewhere that would be charged with effectuating it. And then he would be persuaded out of it because, you know, an expert class told him that was something he couldn't do. But I wasn't there. Uh, you know, you were. So, yeah, so, so tell me how, what the actual <clears throat> dynamic was. Well, AMLO, the current president, right. uh, Lopez Obrador, got into power in December 2018. And, and the first thing the president did with him was threaten to use tariffs against Mexico that would bring their economy down essentially, unless they helped us with immigration, the immigration issues. And he did, he brought out 17,000 troops and he helped us close the border. Those troops were along the border facing south, Mexican Mexican army, yes. So he responded to pressure because it would have crippled his economy if he didn't. And then after we had his cooperation on that, Trump and I talked about the drug war that was uh, toward the end of 2019. And uh, the idea was uh, that we would go down and talk to him about, he had stopped cooperating on, on drugs. Amlo had. Yeah. And what, what changed between 2018 when he was cooperative at the border and then 2019? No, he stopped the with the drugs right at the beginning. Okay. And helping us on the drug war. Even while he was helping us on yes. the border security. Yes. So what, what do you think drove that? His policy is what's called hugs, hugs not bullets. Not bullets. Yeah. Uh, Mexico had a, has a high murder rate, and his idea was let's deal with the root causes of poverty and bring down the crime levels. And one of the things that increases crime levels in his mind was going after the cartels. Oh, because it's like sort of like if you the collateral damage of going after the tumor isn't worth, worth just leave it. the tumor lie right. was sort of his philosophy. Right. And I believe what he basically enunciated and what he wants to do is is really a modus vivendi with sharing sovereignty with the cartels. Don't challenge them. Let them operate. As long as you operate against the gringos in the north, uh, we won't come and pressure you. Mm. So let's you know coexist. Mm. So, But I want to reduce violence in Mexico, so stop killing Mexicans. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. The murder rate is still extremely high, and in fact, was you know fewer people were killed under the Mexican president who was actually going after the cartels, Philippe Calderon. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so he he backed off completely, helping us with the drug war. war. The problem is the Mexican government, uh, during my experience, and I started dealing with this when I was Attorney General the first time, is fundamentally corrupted. 
wh whether or not it goes up to the very top, uh, people have their different opinions on what that. What is your opinion on that? I think I think the top levels of his administration have been compromised. Okay, based on my experience and from what I saw, but but the problem is that there's so much money, and the cartels are so violent going after judges and police officers who are trying to do their job that any government they've gotten the cartels are so strong that any government down there is going to be corrupted over time, and it's impossible to work through them because all the information goes to the cartels. So if you try to do joint operations and clue the Mexicans in on everything, the cartel finds out about it. And so it's, it's a terrible situation because the country is, as I said, it's, it's like being wrapped by a python. You know, they're in the grasp of these groups that have grown stronger and stronger and stronger. A lot of law-abiding Mexicans want to get rid of the cartels. What's dangerous, I mean, AMLO is, AMLO is basically, you know, waving the leftist populist flag like you know these are the gringos to the north that want to come and intervene and so forth and whipping up sentiment there you think he really is oh yeah definitely even amongst the general mexican populace that's what he's doing he's he's you they're know, bringing violence and division to mexico between different right, it's all the americans fault it's the americans demand they're the ones at fault and now they want to come down and and you know attack our country and, and blah 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 and Regular Mexican, I mean, other Mexicans who don't respond to that kind of, uh, you know, populist uh, pandering, uh, basically, you know, how are we going to liberate ourselves from the grasp of these criminal organizations? And there is no answer in Mexico without American, a, a leading American role working with the Mexicans. And I believe, at the end of the day, as as Trump showed, you know, uh, both the economic. Uh, cost to them of not cooperating with us if we, you know, employ tariffs and so forth. Um, and the practical fact that we do have the capacity to go down and act unilaterally, um, you know, they will come along eventually and we'll have to structure it in a way that keeps our information secure. But together, we can dismantle uh, the uh, cartels. That was done in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Very brave Mexican government, uh, uh, Colombian leaders many of whom were assassinated by the cartels, one after the other, joined with the United States, and we eventually destroyed the Medellin and the Cali cartels. So it can be done. How did, how did we do it? Through a combination of law enforcement and, and national security assets, intelligence aspects. We had, you know, the military was not uninvolved in, in Colombia, let me put it that way. Okay. It was not overt then. Right. Got it. And, and I understand there's, there's sort of the channels that the president can act pretty much via the CIA without congressional authority versus, you know, actually getting congressional authority. There's multiple channels of action there. Right. In talking generally, yes, he yeah. has the capa yeah, capacity in, in to principle, do that. Right, yeah. right. Understood. And and when was this in Colombia? I mean, it's a this useful was, This was in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. Yep. And so what happened was the the cartel, I mean, the, the organization, the Mexicans were essentially transporters of marijuana. And they weren't that strong, but they took over the business with the demise of Medellin and, and Cali, and uh, they were allowed to take root and and really be unhampered since then, uh, with with one minor exception. But uh, Amer when the basic problem is this: when local countries, when the United States is ready to go in and do something against the cartels, the local companies generally aren't. And when the and when the local countries are, America has our attention is elsewhere. Do you think that there's something? I think that was definitely true in Mexico too with Calderon. Yeah, you know, he probably would have been our best shot. Right. Yeah. And Obama, I guess, was asleep somewhere between asleep at the switch and didn't prioritize it. Yeah. Well, he came in toward the end of uh, W's administration. Of course, we were at that point engaged in Focused the war elsewhere. on terror. Yep. Right. And so. Um, and it was also sort of the tail end of This is of a Cameron. form of terror, too. Yeah. Let's not yes, say that, is. but the, right. the Middle Eastern form of terror. Right, yeah. right. And nonetheless, so, so, but, but then Obama had his chance and we just sort of squandered it. Right. So the, the Obama administration, the, uh, their principle was to pull back. I call it, you know, extraterritorial engagement. That is going to the source of the drugs and dealing with the head of the snake. That's mm -hmm. always been my view. Yep. And... Uh, they explicitly pulled back from that policy and we're going to fight the drug war at home. 
You know, lock up generation after generation of street pusher rather than deal with the main problem. Right. Right. You know, I'm wondering if there's just like a first principles reason why both in Colombia and in Mexico and other places, it's it can't be a coincidence, right? I think it, it, it seems to me that the US posture would be, whoa, if they're taking care of it already, then we need to less because presumably the country is itself making some incremental progress, which means there's less of a justification or need for us to go in and do it. Like, I think it's not an accident that we see this pattern in history, whereas whenever you have a friendly administration is precisely when we don't partner and engage because we begin to see early positive signs and signals that they're going to deal with it themselves, when in fact, that probably is actually the window we should or should have seized on to actually say that it's when you have a friendly that we actually need to seize that opportunity because otherwise, otherwise you get stonewalled by the likes of an AMLO. Fair to say, just from a first principles reason, it's not a coincidence of history that it happens this way. There's a reason why. Right. But I also think there's another uh, pathology at work, and that is sort of the modern frame of mind. You, you manage problems, you don't solve problems. And so there's this tendency, there's this tendency, I don't know whether it's the Overeducation of the, you know, the you know, going to get their their master's degrees and PhD and diplomacy or whatever, but it always becomes a question of managing the situation mm. instead of saying how do we how do we actually solve this problem, you know, a decisive resolution of this problem. What will it take? And, it's actually yeah. a profound point. It's kind mm. of something about the cultural moment we live in. Yeah, and I see it, management. I see it. A, yeah. Yeah. I see it across the board. And you know, so I have this uh, image of all these pots boiling on the stove that we've allowed to simmer for years. And the problems are mounting. Our foreign policy problems are mounting, our domestic policies. And that's in part because no one has the orientation of let's deal with it and let's take the slings and arrows and the, the cost of dealing with it. And uh, so they'd rather just sort of man mm, manage powerful. things alone. You know, I'm a big believer that language sometimes reveals a reality of the underlying thing that you otherwise would have missed. And so anyway, one of the things that I often rail against is the managerial class, right. the rise of the managerial class. You've seen what that looks like firsthand. Right. Uh, the managerial class is certainly more empowered in American institutions, including government, but corporations to universities is also true. We live in a moment of the managerial class. And I can't help but notice that at least the linguistic parallel yeah. of the rise of the managerial class occurs at a point in our history when we've also grown more accustomed to managing right. problems rather than actually solving them. Right. And, and you know, I think there's probably something to that. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, during even as early as H.W. Bush's administration, before the war on terror emerged, you know, the military was spending a billion dollars a year on intelligence collection against the cartels in Colombia and elsewhere, Peru and so forth. And we were following their plan. We, we, we knew a lot about what they were doing. And I said, what's our end game? Mm -hmm. Why, we're collecting all this intelligence. Are we going to pursue this on law enforcement or national security channel? And there was no discussion or analysis of the problem. Like, how are we going to deal with this? And I said, you have two end games. There are only two end games. You lock them up or you kill them. Okay, which are we going to do? What do you want to do Take with all this intelligence? Exactly. Just tell me what the order is. You know, we'll get it done. This is under H W. H W. Yeah. yeah. What was the answer? Well, it was it was the usual crap. I mean, you had like thirty five agencies involved, and you had coordination meetings and all that stuff. But they never get to the essence of the problem mm -hmm. and and what the strategy is. It, it is the it is this idea of managing managing problems, not not so addressing problems. Where do you think Trump fell on that spectrum? So Trump uh, was much more of the type, let's solve the problem. That's my sense. Yeah. yeah. And so in discussing, in discussing the, uh, the, the drug issue with him, he said something that I give him a lot of credit for, and it's one of his good qualities. Uh, and that, he, you know, I said, look, it's gotten to the point and the size that this cannot be solved with law, you know going down and arresting people and putting them on trial one by one you know you know bringing them into the United States and trying them this is more of a national security threat these are terrorist groups and he said well let's deal with it that's why we're here if we don't do it who's going to do it let's you know stop kicking the can down the road and that was his attitude and i give him credit for that and i think we would have 
But for COVID, I think we would have collected a lot of intelligence. And in a second term, we would have taken more definitive action. So you think that actually Trump and broadly you guys in the administration really were on track to potentially follow through and use military force, yeah. maybe after a year of intelligence groundwork. Land. Right. Yes. I think that would have happened. And why not? I mean, it just wasn't a priority between 2016 and 2018. Right. I mean, okay. there are other, other things to do. But then- Yeah, of course. And I'm, then I'm when, not when criticizing COVID, it. I'm just Yeah, when, K, when yeah. COVID came along, it disrupted everything. But also the problem has worsened, right? The fentanyl crisis has gotten yeah, oh, to be much more yeah. of a national challenge today than it was even in- even in 2015 or 16. Right. But that clearly was coming. We understood that that we was coming. We understood it was coming, point. but yeah. it, it didn't make the priority list. Once it made the priority list, you're saying the administration did actually take certain steps and but for COVID and but for the change in administration, you think it's actually quite likely it would have happened. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, you know, I mean, that was one of Trump's strengths. He had other issues relating to his ability to actually carry out things in, mm -hmm. a, in a coherent way. He would sometimes go for the grand gesture that would win him political approval from his base. You know, he wants, it's, it's almost like a- Well, this can coincide here though, because yeah. this I think would have broad approval from the base and actually solve right. the problem. But sometimes, sometimes he would be willing not to follow through and actually solve the problem. It would be, look, I already did that. I got credit for doing something here. And say, yeah, but it's not That's enough. not the metric of success. Yeah. yeah. Maybe when running a campaign it is. Yeah. Now right. I see this from professional politicians all the time. Right. I was um, to some- <laughs> to some controversy even yesterday, um, you know, pointing out some issues in Ron DeSantis's fight against woke capitalism in Florida. Again, I think that one of the problems with our system, it's not specific even to Ron DeSantis or any other individual, is that when you're in elected office and you, you're up for a reelection, you're rewarded by the surge of media wave and voter response more right. than you are in actually seeing Substance, the thing yeah. through, right. actually. That's exactly right. And, and the problem in this pattern is I, I can imagine seeing the same thing in the Mexican counterpart version of this, but even in dealing with the self-proclaimed problem that Ron wants to address of woke capitalism is the companies at issue or the actor at issue or the nation at issue presumably understands that dynamic, mm -hmm. understands that about us. And so knows that all they need to do is, okay, we're going to weather the storm. Yep. Once you've gotten what you needed out of it, then we'll work it out behind closed doors. And you know that's when the Black Rocks of the world excel at that right. game and I think are excelling in plain sight. That's a discussion for another day. But right. presumably Mexico, <laughs> that, that's the world I know really well, but presumably Mexico can view it the same way too, is okay, we're going to let your cycle of rhetoric play out, gesture what you need to, to your base and then presumably you'll move on and we'll work out the details right. in a way that's actually favorable to the status quo. Right, right. And one thing I just want to stress is that in my mind, it's the Mexicans will eventually agree uh, to a, a much more aggressive U.S. posture uh, against the cartels because they really don't have an alternative. Yeah. Now, AMLO's out in 2024. I think he's term limited yes, out. Is that yes, right? Yes. I don't, I should know more about this. What does the dynamic look like of who the candidates would be to take his place? I mean, I'm not sure polling data matters. It might be who the cartels want that actually get the get the job anyway. But like, what are the possibilities there? And is that something we should be paying attention to? Well, we, sh we should be paying attention to it. But I think it's so murky right now, I couldn't tell yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, if you had a Calderon-like figure or even someone from that orbit, that would be presumably very good for us right. in this objective. Yeah. And the, the other dynamic is this, and I said this to Trump. Uh, which is, you know, the beginning of 2020, I made two trips down to Mexico. I said, even even if the Mexico- When did you go? I went in uh, December and January. To Mexico City? Yeah, yeah. And just like, I guess, very practically, uh, this is like a, a random aside, but suppose you were more open about the policy posture you were going to take against the cartels. Like, is that even just a, from a, personal perspective from a travel, like, is that even a safe trip to make, you think, to, from, a, from a Mexican government perspective or not? I, I just yeah. wonder even about the practicalities of this. Well, step. I guess, you know, I, I would have been maybe brought more security with me if, <laughs> if I was going to take that openly. But what I was going to say is, this is an important thing, which is I said to the president that no Mexican government, even if they're willing to help us and want to get this finished once and for all, they're not going to go in until the beginning of a new administration. They're not going to poke the bear and start a death match with the cartels if there's an administration there with only one more 
You inter- mean like Oberdorf, for example? Yeah. yeah. So and, no, no. Oh, ours. U.S. administration. Yeah, you're not oh, going to poke really? the bear unless you're. That could itself change because somebody can right. Pull Someone the rug comes out in, and pull the rug out so from under. So, you, so that, you, that's a great point. It's why it yeah. has to be done at the beginning of the term. Yes, it has to be yeah. done at the beginning of the term. That's I've identified this as a first six months item for for a big part yeah. of that reason is you can't get into the miring of it and and probably right. even the military side of this, the tactical side of this is once you're past the intelligence gathering phase. You probably get one cycle. You don't want cycles of adaptation here. Well, I, I heard you had said, I mean, I listened to what your statement was, and I thought that was a, a great point, one I totally agree with, that any move has to be done swiftly and with decisive uh, force because otherwise they just adapt to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, th- these people are not 10 feet tall. They can, they can be dealt with, but they just has, they haven't really met their match. Mm-hmm. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. We'll see what we can do on that yeah. front. I, 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 I want to ask you about the legalities, right? Did you did you get any legal challenges to this plan? I mean, you guys, the authority stops with you in the administration or the attorney general. But what was the current thinking with respect to legal authorization to be able to follow through and see that through? Because that's an objection I've heard a lot when I've presented well, this Well, using, using the military outside the United States, it's a national security judgment by the U.S. By president. By the stop. U.S. president. And, and do you think that the Pentagon was aligned with this way of thinking? Um, th- there's always divisions in the Pentagon. Yeah. There are some in the Pentagon who, you know, you ask them to do a military mission and they immediately recoil from it. Uh, but I, I think they, they would. It, I think this issue wasn't one of them. I think as long as there was a defined military objective, you know, this is what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's what the job is. And it was well-defined and not getting us embroiled in sort of an endless situation down there. Uh, And nation building, that's the other point about this, which is, uh, you know, I think think that would have been fine. They don't get to veto that anyway. Um, You know, it's the president's decision. Under international law, you know, the principle in international law is commonsensical, as, as you would expect, which is if, you're, if, if people are using your territory as a launch pad to conduct, you know, predations against a neighbor, you have the, if you're going to claim sovereignty, right, you have to take care of that yourself. You have to stop it. And if you don't stop it, then the country who's being preyed on can come in and do it themselves. I mean, that's- That was the heart of your article. I love the article. Yeah. And and that's an international norms-based argument. But under US law, your point is if it's on the national security side of the house, the president has authorization, period. Right. Basically do whatever. Right. As long as you're, I mean, as long as you're not going after people in the United States and and transgressing constitutional safeguards. So the other question you asked about is using the military to secure the border. You know- under the Posse Comitatus statute, which was passed uh, after Reconstruction in the Civil War, where we used federal troops to police the South, a law was passed that says you can't use American military for law enforcement purposes in the United States. And the reason for that was to prevent uh, the clash of the of American military with its own citizens. Right. And uh, there are exceptions to that. One of them is the Insurrection Act. You know, if there's an insurrection, you can use American military force. Uh, but this is not that. This is not that. And so, yeah, I, 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 I don't want to use the American military. I, I'd be very cautious about using that domestically. What about just protecting the border, though? Literally on the border, or you yeah. can do it on the other side of the. I mean, that that's a technicality, right. I suppose, right. on which side of the Rio Grande it is. But you that's can a use, point. yes, you can use the military. You can also use National Guard. And mm-hmm. and what do you think about the, um, you know, the way the federal government set up is you do have law enforcement over here, military over here. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the rising presence of cartels? even on our side of the border. I mean, you see increasing evidence of that, at least in places like California and even Oregon and Arizona and elsewhere. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, that's one of the that's the reason I consider this a national security threat to allow them to give them this sanctuary south of our border from which they're free to operate. And part of the consequence of that is not only the drugs, it's not only the human trafficking, it's not only the national security problem now posed by them becoming an entry point for over 100 people from over 100 countries around the world. It's also the metastasis of their tactics and their structure up into the United States. So in city after city, they're getting a stronger foothold. And they operate through sort of subsidiary 
mm-hmm. criminal organizations. Uh, and, and you know, there was that case in, in California, which I'm concerned that where they wiped out a family, including an infant. And I'm concerned uh, that they're going to start taking their tactics, their extortion and terrorist tactics up north of the border. And if we, we have to stop these people. I agree with you yeah. that it strengthens the case for solving the problem. Yeah. Narrowly, I was asking about the dilemma that that proposes in terms of even who you put in charge. If it's a Pentagon-driven operation, but you're talking about, you know, posse comitatus, you know. Right. Yeah. So, so, so the cartel problem, I think you want to solve it comprehensively. I'd like to take care of it, not just on the Mexican side, unless you really believe if the head of the snake dies, the tail in the U.S. automatically withers away. That, that's, a, that's one theory of the case. But if not... How do you divide up that operation for the part of this that's on the U.S. side of the border itself? So I'm not for in, uh, for entirely, quote, militarizing the war on drugs. I think yep. we can use the military- Tactically certain, south ta- of the border. Yeah, in, in certain gotcha. ways. Gotcha. But I do think law enforcement should continue its It's going to require some level of coordination. Yeah. And, and I, don't under, Touch, yeah. I don't have a good sense, you probably do, of just even bureaucratically, like the way the government yeah. is set up. Is that set up for success or not? No. I mean, it's not set up for success. It's set up for just managing. That's uh, my sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and what you need is clear direction from the president as to how this is going to be done and put people in charge that can, you know, manage it on a day-to-day basis. There's certain things that would, you know, like inter, inter, interdiction at sea, that's a military, that's largely a military operation, you know, using the Coast Guard and the Navy. There are other parts like the DEA would be involved and DEA is very skillful at certain kinds of things down in foreign countries. So. Yeah, the, the DEA is interesting. Mean, most people I've talked to at the DEA, or, or either at the DEA or formerly, are actually pretty excited about this plan yeah. because they they see firsthand the consequences of failing to actually address the root cause. Right. Um, I my sense is most people in the military, I mean, I think would be ground level, pretty mission aligned. With well, I think the special operations would absolutely. Be. Yeah, um, and. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of other things that go into it. The use of the Treasury Department to to get involved in financial assets, fin- yeah. go after financial assets, sanctioning banks, Mexican banks that are involved in this. So, in the law enforcement, let's say on the on the domestic side, it's not purely a military function, as you said, dealing with this right. this fentanyl issue, including the cartel driven side of it. Right. Um, the FBI would be involved, presumably, would be the agency. From a law enforcement side, that would lead this or no? <clears throat> Not no. In in, DEA. S- in South America, it would it would you know probably the FBI has involvement, and there's certain things they do very well down there. But there are other agencies involved, including the DEA, and there's you know the agency, the CIA is involved, and that's one of the issues. There are a lot of different players here, but there's no overall definitive strategy. Like this is how we're going to win. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always an intermediate objective. You know, let, let's let's arrest these three people. Let's build a case against this. Let's you know, and and there's no overall sort of anaconda strategy of uh, squeezing them quickly. Speaking of the FBI, I mean, we want to shift gears to that in terms of yeah, talking about managing a problem. Um, actually, I don't want to I don't want to assert my premise without asking you about it. I think the politicization of the FBI is a problem in our country. I think that the agency has demonstrated that it acts with often politicized motives that have both undermined public trust in the agency and have demonstrated that the agency is itself not fully worthy of full public trust without the skepticism that many now have towards the FBI. But before I go to solutions, I don't want to uh, just bake it on a uh, premise that maybe you might have a different point of view on. Like, what's your candid view on that? Is that a so is, I have is a, that a well grounded perspective? Or not? I think it's a mistake to look at the FBI and even DOJ in isolation, in terms of their becoming you know a corrupted institution. Not corrupted in the sense of personal graft, but people who are sacrificing you know the values and processes and so forth of, of the institution. I think what's happening at at the department, what's happening at the FBI, is across the board. Not only across, in the federal government, not only the federal government, but all our institutions: mm-hmm. science, medicine, sure, everything, business. education, business, mm-hmm. and it's all the corruption of our institutions that's going on. And in some ways, 
what stands out about the – actually, if I were to sort of rank them as how thoroughly – uh, compromise the institutions are. I'm not sure the FBI or the Department of Justice would be that high on the list. But as Shakespeare said, lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. It's because mm. of the sensitivity mm -hmm. of the fun. I it's, agree with that. Yeah. It's the sensitivity of the function they're performing and how much we really rely on these institutions that catches our attention about these failings, these institutional failings. But I think they all go back to the same thing. Um, the, the Comey episode in Russiagate gave people the impression that the FBI was rotting from the head, that it was the leadership that was corrupt. Uh, or, or It's not my impression. Yeah. My impression is it's, it's found its way maybe less deeply than into universities, fair enough, but permeated, I think, the culture. Right. Of the bureaucracy itself. Right. And part of that, I think, was, you know, Mueller coming in and sort of announcing he was going to change the culture of the FBI. And uh, and that was carried out by Comey as well. What, what did they mean when they said that? I'm not sure exactly what they meant. <laughs> but, uh, it, it you know, got, the, you know, the idea I mean, was- You know these people. You've worked with them. Yeah. What do you think they meant? Uh, did they mean in the direction of depoliticizing it? Did they mean the direction of making more results oriented? Like, was that going to come change the culture of the FBI? Like, presumably, what did they mean? I think what they had in mind was that the FBI was the, you know, was a law enforcement entity with a law enforcement culture. And it recruited mainly from the military and from law enforcement, police officers who had had good careers. And so the people understood chain of command. And they, and, they, and they approach things from a law enforcement standpoint, which is, you know, following the process is very important. And um, uh, being even-handed is very important. So for, you're not results-oriented, mm -hmm. okay? And what they had in mind after 9-11 was that, we, well, we're no longer cops and robbers type agency. We're no longer go and react to crime. We have to prevent it from mm -hmm. happening in the first place. And so we had, I think it was sort of a foggy concept that they sort of wanted, you know, we just want something, you know, we want more, um, you know, different kinds of people involved and so forth. So. This is, this is super interesting though. I think yeah. you're right over the flame here. Yeah. Because I think it does start with, you know, call it a good yeah. intention, call it what you want. This idea of, th that's actually very important, right? So you think it's in the post 9-11 era. Right. That's when Mueller came over the first time. Yeah. Well, oh, he was there. He was yeah. there. Yeah. He was the head of the FBI. He had just become head of the FBI. Post 9-11. And then Comey took over after. Right. And so the whole idea was we have to prevent this stuff from happening. And so um, I think they've ch they've changed the intake process. So the kinds of people coming in, you know, are kindergarten teachers and social workers and so forth. Really? Yeah. To join the FBI? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So there's a lot more uh, different backgrounds that are, that are attracted into the into the bureau and they dumbed down some of the, the requirements early on. Nowadays, the physical requirements have been decreased by two thirds, what they used to be. Mm -hmm. That has changed the culture in the FBI. You know, I've heard reports of, you know, the FBI has uh, firearms instructors in various places around the country to make sure that the agents in that area, the city and so forth, keep care of their guns, have the right armaments, you know, stay qualified and so forth. And there's some reports there from there of agents coming in to turn in their weapons because they feel it's socially irresponsible to carry a gun. That would have never happened 15 years ago. Just the opposite. Wait, wait someone's, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I had to process that for yeah. a second. So I mean, someone's that's working at the, the FBI, yeah. who's an agent saying that they kind of came in to yeah. turn in their gun yeah, because the member of a law enforcement Community like an the agent, FBI, an, an agent, agent comes in and says, "I don't want to carry a gun anymore because it's socially irresponsible. So, so socially irresponsible. irresponsible. Uh, were they fired on the spot? No, that's another problem with the FBI, which is, and this is a problem throughout government and probably throughout the corporate world, which is the failure of middle management because yeah, no they, kidding, yeah, they become careerists and they don't want to get into trouble. And so it's don't rock the boat for the next two years. I'm doing this job. My next job is going to be this if I don't rock the boat. That leads to a, a whole career service within the agency mm -hmm. that is geared more toward people, you know, careerists rather than 
the agents who are really doing the job out in the street. And so, uh, you know, that's one of my concerns. And, and discipline has broken down in part because a lot of managers know that if they discipline certain employees, you know, a woman agent or a minority agent, they're going to get in trouble for that. Their career, hmm. their career will be upset. Oh, you had this altercation, you know, where you were accused of discrimination and therefore you're not going to move forward. And so they'll just ignore problems. Who decides that that person's not going to move forward though? Why is that the culture of the agency? It just has become. That's a, uh, just the way it's become. And, and it's, there's also, you know, in my mind, there's too much orientation toward Washington headquarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, there are people who become what they call headquarter rats. They sort of hang around and when they're required to do a field, they, they move to some place, you know, they do it in Washington field office or someplace very close to Washington and then they rotate back into Washington. So there are, there, there are a host of issues that, that are involved, but they're issues that are in every institution. And underlying it is a, a change in a what I consider to be sort of a progressive mindset uh, of, of younger people even if they don't wholly embrace the progressive agenda, they actually start thinking Mindset. this way. No, I, yes. it's a and then the, a bureaucracy ossifies that. That's the way that it works. Right. But also, the basic premise of it is that because we are seeking this pure objective of a perfect, earthly, equitable society, salvation on earth, mm -hmm. a collective salvation, not an individual salvation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That what we, you know, it does replace religion in terms of meaning in people's lives and they can justify departing from the, departing from the value and, and standards of the institution because they are pursuing something higher and more important. So it's the willingness to say, I'm going to, I'm going to leak this information mm -hmm. uh, or I'm going to go after this guy because this guy's a bad guy and how I justify it is it's the right thing to do for equity. That means that all institutions essentially lose their actual function. Totally. And they're all become little mini, uh, you know, we're after, so what's your goal? Social justice. School, is your, is your goal read, teaching kids how to think and reading, writing, arithmetic? No, we're not doing a good job of that, but we are, pro we are promoting social justice. And you go through institution after institution. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I mean, it, it, this is more familiar to me than uh, than I might have guessed in terms of the managerial rot of the FBI. It's not something foreign. It's actually something very familiar. Yeah. It's not something – and that's why I say, you know, actually, uh, I think as institutions goes, it's – it's not as bad as most of the institutions. No, but it's, but it's, but it's, it's the most – it's arguably among, if not the right. most important, yes. where we have to be right. sterile right. with respect to right. this. Right. That's my view. Because that's the, that's the backdrop. Mm -hmm. Stable law enforcement. Yeah. I would say maybe the court system. Fair-minded. Court system is probably highest on the list. This is second up. Mm -hmm. Right. The prosecutorial yes. system. Yes. And the investigatory right. power of the federal state. Right. The federal police power. Yeah. You've you've kind of cast a light on a different dimension of this, which in some ways actually makes the case for my proposed course of action even more strongly and perhaps even more persuasive than just the top-down politicized version that I have appealed to in certain of my speeches. But the proposed solution I've put on offer is, as US president, I'll shut down the FBI and create a new agency built from scratch with a different fit for purpose culture that is not yet captured by a cancer that once it's taken a foot is very difficult to eradicate because it's more or less like a cancer and more like a virus that's embedded itself into the DNA of the organization itself. Shutting it down and creating something new is the easiest path or at least the most plausible path to solve that problem even if it comes at some transition cost. That's my view on it. I'd be curious for your perspective and both on the merits, but also on the implementation of that and what that looks like. You, you'd be a pretty good person to advise on it. So, you know, there are two ways of dealing w with an organization that is that is corrupt or cancerous yeah, or infected. Yeah, in fact, yeah, yeah. One is to just start a new one, mm -hmm. which I come to the problem usually 
leaning in that direction because of sort of the history of the Catholic Church, which is whenever when an order went bad, you just create a new order. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to do that and and better in the long run than trying to reform something that's mm -hmm. broken. In this case, I think right now I would come down a little bit more in the middle, which is this. After 9-11, there was this push to separate the foreign intelligence and intelligence aspects of the Bureau from the law enforcement, pure law enforcement aspects. To say that that one coordinates more with the CIA yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and, right? and just separate them into two different agencies. And I opposed that at the time because there are a lot of good practical reasons to have them together. One is so that you, you don't have that wall of separation that led to 9-11, right, mm -hmm. and sharing information. But we're also seeing, you know, some abuses. Uh, and what I think maybe the best approach would be is I do think you need some catalyst to actually make the kind of reforms within the FBI and law enforcement generally. And, and I think maybe splitting those apart now would provide you with the catalyst to accomplish other reforms. Yeah. In other words, just sort of sitting back and saying, okay, we're going to start an agency from scratch or, you know, we're going to reform the FBI. You need some kind of systemic shock. You need like half the people moving out of the building. You need to break yeah. it into two and yeah. then use that to actually, you know, Accomplish. drain the yolk, you yeah. know, inside, break the egg and then right. drain the yolk. Yeah, something like and that. I think they've, you know, they have a, a problem that all, all big institutions and especially governments, they've become highly bureaucratic and they try to do too much. And they have all their little processes. And the processes, you know, were well intentioned. When you have all these people running around with guns, right? Right. Power to, you know, you want to keep things harnessed. And that that's a good thing. But they've become extremely bureaucratic and risk averse in many ways. So um, I think to change the FBI, I'd be more open now to splitting the FBI in two. Uh, as as sort of a catalyst for reform, but at the end of the day, leadership Splitting has a lot too, to do. But then with also this. go for, go the distance for use that to just gut a lot of what's in there. I wouldn't use the word gut, but uh, you know, some of it has to be turn over yeah, yeah. mass amounts of right, people. Right, and and I think go back to some of the standards that we used to have as the FBI agents and things like that. And uh, you know, this is not a social experiment. And the other thing is, you know, this goes across all our institutions. Play your damn position. Uh, everyone wants to be, uh, you know, as I say, they, uh, the, the, the end goal of my institution is to pursue, to pursue social justice. That's not how our system works. Our system works by breaking. It's like the division of labor. You educate our children. You put bad people in prison in our search for justice and so forth. You know, these different – the press, get at the objective truth. Mm -hmm. Those are supposed to be the functions of these institutions. And, they've, and you know, like look at the media. They don't care about finding the objective truth. It's, mm -hmm. they, they are a cog in the progressive agenda. And what's important is the narrative, not the objective truth. And so all these institutions are sacrificing their mission, the mission we expect from these institutions – and they have this sort of, you know, hazy idea of some brave new world that they're promoting. Right. Okay. Don't worry about that. Do your job. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that, that actually restores institutional integrity. integrity. Yes. That's actually the thing we've lost. Right. This is the vision of this term. You'll hear the great reset. You're, you're familiar with this terminology. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the people use this term and bandied around, but the essence of the worldview inherent in the great reset Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum type stuff. And now if a conservative says the same word, they'll say it's a conspiracy theory, but put that to one side. What is it? What is the right. thing? Right. It, it, it's a worldview that calls for the dissolution of boundaries, right. actually. Dissolving the boundary between the private sector and the public sector. Dissolving the boundary between nations. Dissolving the boundary between different institutions so that each or leaders of each can work together towards address shared global problems towards the common good. Agree or not, right? That is on, in neutral terms what proponents of the Great Reset would say that it stands for. Right. And I think that you see it – I mean, you and I, I think it's probably what drew us together even – you know, maybe some of my commentary on ESG maybe appealed yeah. to you for some of those yeah. subtextual reasons. I think the question is – it's a philosophical question about how you just think the world, humanity and its institutions should be ordered. Is it 
that these boundaries are inherently bad and that we need to break down and dissolve those boundaries so that institutional leaders can coordinate towards addressing a common good. Right. Or is it that you believe in institutional integrity, part of true institutional pluralism, just because you say capital D diversity, it's actually an off the shelf agenda that dissolves the boundaries between different institutions right. and makes them less diverse. Do you believe in actually institutional pluralism, the diversity of different institutions to each carry out their respective functions? I know where you stand, play your, play your damn position, pretty right. good quote. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take that one with me. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just two different worldviews. It's not even, a, it has nothing to do with partisan politics. It's a worldview of how the world itself should be ordered. I actually think I, I think it has a lot to do with politics, though. I mean, it's, oh, it, I mean, it has to do with yeah. politics, but not, not in the partisan politics yeah. sense of the present moment. Right, I mean, that's, that's right. This is that's something, right. something deeper yes. that trans right. transnational, transpartisan. But also goes to religion. It goes to religion because, absolutely because there's, a, there's a deeply you know I would say you could say there's a Hindu worldview, but yeah. you could say there's a Christian worldview embedded in that distinction. Right. So I think basically the fundamental question is you know te teleology. What has a purpose? Is does the individual life have a target and purpose, or is it the collective that mm -hmm. has a target and purpose? The Western, yes. the yes. Western, the Western worldview that gave rise to the most successful system we've had, the the Anglo American uh, system, uh, was rooted in in uh, the Judeo Christian tradition, which views. Uh, individuals as individuals and so you know that your desk you have a destiny it's, now it's a transcendent destiny but also it's an individual destiny and the collective is you know we worry about the collective and providing a stable environment in which people can live their individual lives what what we have now is essentially you know it's 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 part of you know it's undergirded marxism and and other uh, totalitarian ideas going back to the French Revolution, which is the dest your destiny is collective. The human, you, the, the thing that has a target and a goal is the collective. The political arrangement of society, you're a cog in that. Mm -hmm. History has a direction, the directionality of history. That's why we always hear, Yo, you're on the wrong side of yeah, history. Yeah, the wrong yeah. side. It's exactly right. right. So the it's idea a, it's is- a deep observation, it, right? You know, yeah. this, this is the progressive idea, which is they've, you know, Buckley used to say that they immunitized the eschaton, which is they've taken the final things and they've immunitized it. They've brought it down to the world. Mm. And so heaven is a future place we're all going to go. And the way we're going to get there is through political action and political organization and building a collective that's perfect. Mm -hmm. A collective, perfectly just collective. And that those are the two worldviews, but they ultimately give rise to very different politics. And that's why I feel what's happening today in the United States is not just right versus left. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's of a different order altogether. To me, the Democratic Party, the progressive wing has moved outside uh, the tent. They mm -hmm. are, you know, their agenda is to tear down the system, not fight within the system, mm -hmm. within the tent, you know, a right wing and a left wing. But they're now outside the system and the great impediment to human progress and to building this just society are all our institutions and conventions. Moving outside the system, specifically in rejecting this notion of individual purpose yeah. itself as just yes. the teleology, just right. the whole, the rule of the game is written. Right. It's a very fundamental, way. when you start thinking, I mean, to me, that's that's the essence of it. Uh, and uh, it's also the difference of fundamentally uh, between conservatism and you know progressivism. A lot of conservatives, I think, make the mistake to think that conservatism is the mirror image of progressivism, mm. which is ideology. We have an ideology, which means we are going to use politics to shape society mm -hmm. collectively according to some abstract vision of perfection. That, mm -hmm. To me, that's what ideology is. Mm -hmm. That's not what conservatism is about. Uh, we're about essentially muddling through mm -hmm. uh, to, to have a, a, you know, a, a durable, stable society, which gives the broadest vent possible, consistent with order, to individuals, Finding their destiny, both as individuals and in voluntary association, the civil society, and and that is what has led to the success of 
of the United States and the West generally. And uh, not the idea of, you know, that we have some kind of game plan uh, to, to organize ourselves politically according to some abstract scheme of perfection, because mm -hmm. we're not dealing with perfection, we're dealing with human beings. Hmm. Yeah, how much do you think the loss of faith, I think, creates the... Window. The window. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a secular account, and you go John Locke on this or mm -hmm. whatever else, that'll get you still to that fundamentally American yes. worldview. So it's not that religion is a precondition, but I, right. it strikes me that the, the recession of faith plays a role that allows the collective purpose worldview to right. reign supreme. Right. So I agree with you. It's not a precondition for individuals to come to the conclusion. I don't that, think so. Yeah. Yeah. That this is the but it best. But make it easier. This yeah. is, yeah. But I think the framers would have said, and this is what my speech at Notre Dame was about, which is our constitution was actually written uh, taking- Moral people. Of, of a religiously disciplined people. John Adams, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and it's true. I mean, uh, if, and you know, as, as Burke said, you know, if, if you don't control yourself, then an external force is going to control you. Mm -hmm. Was that Burke? Something along, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. something like by their passions, they forged their own fetters or something, mm -hmm. you know, they become mm -hmm. enslaved to, and, you know, so, I mean, uh, Burke, I used it in my speech at Notre Dame. So mm -hmm. it's, but, um, yeah, it's certainly, I think the loss of faith in the West, uh, is, what is generating a lot of the decomposition of society mm -hmm. and providing the opportunity for these ersatz faiths, secular faiths to emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of my one of my views is you could either take faith, family, patriotism, belief in nation, faith in a nation, you could say. Mm -hmm. And America was built on a sort of civic religion sure. for a long time. Yeah. Hard work as a value of what you create, you know, pick a couple of them. Yes. But you can't have all of them disappear at the same time. Right. Or else you keep, get this vacuum mm -hmm. that something else is going to fill instead. I guess that's a version of the Burkean concept. You can yeah. say, that, you know, uh, uh, Blaise Pascal said something similar, yeah. hold the size of God. Right. If God doesn't fill it, something else will. But right. wh whoever, whichever, <laughs> you know, philosopher triangulated on the same concept that's the, that's i think that's the description of where we are yeah. in our modern moment in american history this is part of the modern american experience is that loss right. of purpose and meaning and identity that allows that siren song of collective purpose to then fill the void right now it raises an interesting question of whether the path to reviving that individual sense of purpose comes from restoring some sense of you could say collective purpose as Americans. Um, I don't know what your reaction to that is, or if that's getting a little too philosophical for you. No, I mean I think that that's you know one of the key, the the key questions. I I, I do think this is something that can only be de developed within coherent uh, societies that is genuine communities in mm -hmm. some way, which you don't have just by being you know a manager of. Uh, of, uh, of any welfare state, yeah, exactly. you know, okay, someone new showed up, okay, let's write a check for them. Mm -hmm. There has to be something deeper than that. Uh, and uh, I think we're, we're losing our sense of that completely. Mm -hmm. And as you say, you know, this world without borders or without allegiance, uh, there's a lot, it's a very daunting uh, situation, but I think one way to, that's why I've always been a big advocate of school choice. I think there's no road back unless we have school choice in this country. I'm an advocate of school choice too, but I don't believe in silver bullets because I think one of the things that we're now seeing, I don't think a lot of conservatives have woken up to this, but it, it's the direct extension of what we had in this conversation of the so-called long march through the institutions is now the accreditation bodies that accredit a private school that's eligible to receive funds from a school voucher program or a school choice or a ESA program, educational saving account program, is itself infected by some of the same dogmas that start with the Department of Education that create the cultural infection of yeah, the primary battle. education in this country. So it just kicks the can. It's like, it's like a- The I battle shifts. Exactly. You squeeze in one place, the, the, it, as long as the water flowing through the pipes is still the problem, it's like a hydraulic pump. If you squeeze in one place, it just you know shows up in a different place unless you really purify yeah. the water itself.
but it clarifies issues and it makes it, it more transparent. Oh, it's a step forward, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. And because th then the, the fight is more transparent. But the other thing is people have completely missed the the what's going on here, which is Americans, when we founded our country, we would have said that you know the state has no business telling people what the good life is and you know, telling them how to live a good life and f using coercive power to force them to do it. That was the classical world. Mm -hmm. That was Sparta, where you turned your kid over to the state. And with, with, with Christianity led to this bifurcation. The state has a limited role mm -hmm. and education is the role of the parents and the church, moral education. Mm -hmm. Now, we were able to allow the state to play a role in that in this country because the country was 95% Christian and agreed on the values. Mm -hmm. And public schools were run as essentially that way. But now there is no consensus. And the government is affirmatively subversive of traditional values. So people have to step back and say, wait a minute, what power does a school board or the government have? to determine what moral education is and shove it down the throat of people. They don't under our system. It's not the function of government. A, a collective determination that my kids should be taught an ism. It's one thing to teach kids facts. It's one, you know, how to read, write, and so forth. And that's why I think actually you, you put your finger on, I think, the pulse of what I see a lot of conservatives across this country recognize when I've been traveling, you yeah. know, Iowa, yeah. New Hampshire, different places, South Carolina. It's not that actually the question is even where, where the sort of intellectual battlefront might have been in decades past of what role the state ought to have in inculcating traditional religion or not. Right. The state is already inculcating so, modern modern religions more than it ever has in the history of this country, right. foisting Christianity or any other, any other religion. It's our failure to recognize it as, as such is I think the um, – is actually what allowed it to happen. I mean, the climate cult, I think you could, I, I wouldn't say in a strict sense, make an establishment clause violation in a constitutional argument in court. But the spirit of it is we are effectively have a government established religion deciding that carbon emissions, that the anti-impact framework is itself, a, it's, a, it's a form of a cultish belief right. as opposed to some other metric mattering for humanity, like human prosperity itself. Right. But we've decided that even every metric, and it's perpetuated through the government in every sense, about what you even measure in terms of a carbon emission is itself the product of a cultish conviction yeah. that the anti-impact framework, meaning that the human being's impact on the environment is the supposed thing we're supposed to measure as opposed to the environmental impact on humans, right. that's established as a sort of religion in this country. And the idea that we were ever debating the establishment of Christianity or Judaism or whatever else is a farce compared to the modern reality right, right. of what's really established as the state religion today. Right. And, the tra and the transsexuals. Uh, oh, the transgender stuff. Perfect stuff, example. Absolutely. Yeah. Trans perfect yeah. example of it. Yeah. You know, it's completely incompatible with traditional religious belief, and yet the government thinks it can force it down people's throats. Well, the, th the thing that I just took away I'm in, in, in this conversation that I'm so grateful for is I've been – entrenched in these issues for the last several years. And I, I don't know, have you read my books? Or any yes. Of them? Okay, you've yes. seen, you, you know, so you're I, familiar I, with where I come from yeah. there. Maybe that's why you set it up this way yeah. for me, which I appreciate, which is when I'm looking from the outside in, a daunting challenge like the bureaucratic cancer at the FBI or at other government agencies, part of me feels like I'm ready to take it on, but that's got to be a daunting challenge because that's a new institution specific bureaucratic failure and i think one of the things you've done in this conversation very helpful to me maybe you intended to do this and you succeeded uh, it's very helpful is open my eyes to the fact that that governmental bureaucratic challenge is not so unfamiliar to me even relative to the tack problems i've been tackling in other parts of our culture or the private sector which is encouraging but i still think some of the things you've been talking about i mean we, we do have to change the civil service laws and allow presidents much more latitude in managing their own branch of government. Yeah. And uh, also, I think we have to move agencies out of Washington, D.C. Oh, I love in, that. In, in a radical way. Uh, because there's- And the there's, reorganization powers allow for that, I think, uh, for a U.S. Yeah, president to do yeah. it. I think we should move, I mean, uh, I would move uh, agencies not to primary cities, not to cities that are already big and have their urban problems, but to other places in the country. 
Uh, I would have liked to move a lot of the FBI down to Huntsville, Alabama, where we already have a campus down there. But uh, not just the FBI, but all the agencies. We don't need everything concentrated uh, in Washington, D.C. And as you know, the business world is now reorganizing itself. Mm -hmm. You know, and oh, I like that quite a bit. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that are appealing about it. One of them is it's an easy way of uh, getting a lot of people who don't want to move <laughs> right. out of the system. So right. uh, yeah, that's something I'm definitely working on. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll be... You know, picking up the phone and calling you from time to time if you're okay with it as we set in, as set in place the plans of sure. how exactly I think we're going to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think you're, as I told you, I think you're a great voice out there, you know, so clear and, and uh, saying a lot of the things that have to be said. Well, what we're going to try to do, thank you for saying that, is to translate that into action through national leadership, which hopefully comes with a mentality of not just managing the problems that we have, but actually picking at least a few of them. I gotta, you're not going to get one person who solves all of them, but pick a few of them and don't just manage them, you solve them. Right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, this is an incredibly useful conversation. I have a I've enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, we're going to so. have a few more of them. You, you have to come to Columbus. When we do this oh, again, yeah. we, have, we have a lot to pick up. I, we didn't even touch the DOJ, mm -hmm. which I want to get into. So um, I, let's say that you know we're talking right now in DC on a on-the-road edition of the podcast, right. but let's keep our plan to do one in Columbus – Sure. Intact if you're Love to that. do it. Yeah. Love we'll to pick do up it. where we left off. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Bill. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.